welcome everyone. I think Shoba Day set us up for a great afternoon of food. Yeah. Um, as many times as she said food, I said, oh God, this is a perfect segue into our next segment. Uh, and before I start, just to uh, carry off from Shoba, I found that the three of you all have something in common with Shoba. I'm going to ask you guys what that is, and then I have the answer if you don't. <laughs> Mani, can I start with you? No, you just talk all of <laughs> Good answer. And mom, hint, hint. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, Mani, sir, uh, Mani G, Mani, sir, Mani, whatever. Um, uh, I know you said you wanted to be called Mani, so I'll, I'll try to stick to that. Um, so, uh, Shoba also played basketball in school, and you told me that was one of the ways you got an in and college. So, there you go. That's what you have in common with her. Um, and Payal, I know you just walked in from a birthday celebration in Napa, so you didn't hear Shoba, but do you, do you know? So, so I, oh, there you go. You both are from, uh, lived in Bombay, and uh, I believe Shoba was in modeling and advertising, and you have that background as well. And then um, Suki, I, actually I didn't introduce myself, so let me step back. I'm Suki's daughter, Sanjo Singh, who's also worked with the company for a long time, but she was the one who started this and gave us all inspiration to join her. Um, so, so uh, Suki, what do you think you have in common with her? A badass woman. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you, I'll give <laughs> So, um, all the guests have been in business for over 20 years, uh, providing us nourishment and dishes from the homeland. They've made Indian food accessible on a whim. Um, no longer do parents of international students coming from India have sleepless nights thinking about how their child is eating in America. And children of the local South Asian diaspora are introducing their parents to good Indian food without spending hours in the kitchen. So welcome all of you over here um, to this very interesting conversation on food at a literature festival. And thank you again to Shobha Day who connected it all very well for us. Um, so uh, I want to introduce... Uh, I'll start with Mani. Um, hailed as the batter man or dosa king of California, Mani Krishnan started in 2003 to bring uh, dosa to millions of South Asian families in the U.S. Today, 20 years later, Shasta Foods has sold over 170 million dosas. <laughs> ah, okay. So consumed. Um, thanks for clarifying that. I was actually giving you a higher accolade than that. Um, and so he has an automated 35,000 square foot facility uh, that's producing over 27,000 pounds of batter every day. Shasta Foods is distributed in 350 stores across 10 states. Um, second is Suki. I'm kind of going in that direction. Um, so Suki started her journey in 1991, selling into the first 110 retail stores, store by store, in the first year. And today, Suki's Gourmet Indian Foods is sold in 8,000 stores nationwide, with a range of 28 products, from samosa to chicken tikka masala. Suki's chicken tikka masala is sold in every Costco across the country. Um, and that just goes to prove... <laughs> That just goes to prove that there are only two types of people in this world. Go ahead. Those who love Indian food and those who haven't eaten it yet. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Payal Saha. She has single-handedly made a visit uh, to the Kati Roll Company, a must-do of New York. Woo. Starting with her first location in 2002 to now four locations in the Big Apple, Payal has brought a taste of home in a cheery environment for the South Asian diaspora, while also giving an irresistible and satiating Indian food introduction to the mainstream. Today, Payal produces a million kati rolls a year, and this is just the beginning. So, to start off with the discussion, actually clap again, because you guys clapped after everybody. <laughs> we have to do this, right? Do this the right way. This is my first time moderating, guys, so I'm just, you know. Um, <laughs> so, to start off the discussion, I know that all of you did not set out to do food. Mani, you came from accounting and basketball. <laughs> 
and uh, uh, Payal, you sociology for you, and mom, English and biology for you, and then teaching and so forth. So what is it that, um, when did this interest of food develop? And when did it meet the opportunity of turning it into a flourishing business like you have? And I, uh, let's start with you, Mani, and actually let's go this way, mom. So when did the interest in food start? Was it something in your childhood, something that you always knew you wanted to do and just weren't able to do it? And how did it turn into a flourishing Actually, business? You know, I was just telling somebody outside that my first memory, is, no. my first memory of food Perfect. is, you know, my grandmother, Close who right. used to live with us, we, she had a maid who would cook for us. And this maid used to steal something every day, but she refused to fire her because the food she made is what she loved to eat. And I still is have... Is it not close enough? Okay. Oh. Oh, okay, okay. Good, good. Yeah, that's an exciting. So I still have the memory of the Bengan alu she made in a small chula outside in the veranda. And I can smell that food and I can taste it. And that was, I guess, one of the first recipes that I put together commercially when I started selling. Gradually, as we went on, my interest in food was always there, but not as a profession, because, you know, in India, when you are a kid, you either got to be a doctor or a teacher or an engineer, and food was not a career to have. Sorry. How much? So, didn't think of it as a career, but it was always something I did on the side. My husband was posted to England. I did baking course in the College of, uh, baking college of Ealing, went back home and I used to do baking classes in my house. But I was a teacher in uh, the Hampton Court and Waverley Convent in Missouri. And on the side, I would be doing this. In the summer, I, with a friend of mine, I opened a hamburger sta mm -hmm. uh, stand downstairs in, in the Missouri. And I mean, I was always doing something in food, which was not my profession. Coming, we went to England, then we came to the US. And the US, I started doing substitute teaching, and I found this was not for me. You had to write a whole story for these parents when they came to pick up their kids at 6 o'clock. What did he eat? How did he get this scratch? What did you do to take care of him? And I said, forget it. I'm not going to do teaching. And I moved out. <laughs> and then I, we bought a sandwich place in Oakland, which was doing well. And then we had the Loma Prilita earthquake. And everything, our grosses fell $700 a day. And we started just surviving. So that's how I. Perfect. Perfect. I had no background in food at all. I mean, I uh, did sociology in college, and then I worked for a filmmaker in Bombay, an ad filmmaker. And then my husband got a job here in New York, and um, I was on a visa that didn't allow me to work. I was on an L2, and um, I always thought that the product that I sell, the party roll, is really matched for New York City because it's um, food that's on the go. And um, New Yorkers basically are an adventurous people when it comes to food. So I thought that um, I actually want to do a little stall, like a little um, cart um, in the city somewhere. But I found out that the cart, the wait list was 15 years. And after that, it's a lottery. So it was not going to happen for me. and. Um, then I started looking at brick and mortar and going to food like that. I just, for me, it's just that I love food and I love Gati rolls. I grew up eating them and um, yeah, I just was thought that came. I mean, I didn't ever want to do sociology ever in my life, like, <laughs> ever. Uh, I, just, I, just, I just did it because I had to be a graduate, according to my parents, but I really was, had nothing that I wanted to do with sociology. It just, I guess, a natural thing. Um, something that I really, the product I love, and that's how it happened. Okay. I'm not going to be using the mic. I hope oh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is anyway, my name is Mani Krishnan. Uh, I came to this country in 1977. I've been here 46 years, and I feel more confident about telling this after listening to Shobha <laughs> 
So my basic background is I am an accounting graduate. I plunged in science and got into accounting, not because of my academic skills, but because of my ability to play basketball. <laughs> That's how I got into Moda College, and uh, it was one of the prestigious colleges. And those days, Tendulkar used to play cricket with Vaidhi Pandavar. Ring circle was part of my team. I mean, part of the college, you know. So that is how I migrated in '77, and I hated accounting. So I worked for a couple of electronic companies for about uh, three or four, for five or six years. Then uh, I decided to start an export electronic business. That is what I did for about 20 years. So from processors to processed food is the story <laughs> I want to tell. And in 2003. I couldn't collect uh, about $2 million uh, from some of the Indian clients. Companies wow. like HCL, Wipro were all my customers. Ironically, Arjun Malhotra, who is the founder of uh, HCL, uh, was one of my first customers when I did business in, in the 90s. And today, here I am speaking in a forum organized by his wife. <laughs> anyway, I, I, you know, 2003, we could collect uh, 2 million, $2 million, and I lost my shirt. Not too far. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, I had to do something because it was very difficult for me to pad up my resume and to go and work for someone because I knew my accounting ability. <laughs> and uh, I decided it is better to be miserable on your own than to be miserable working for somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I I started with filter coffee the one which I started in 2003. The H1 crowd and everything, you know, just happened. And that will be started in a very small way. We started at Cash and Carry. You know, I started, there was another backer already there. The owner said, Sabji, I said, uh, you know, don't keep it in Mosa, keep Utapur. <coughs> so I kept there. Now I have 80% of the shelf after 20 years. That's great. That's great. So, what I what I want to basically communicate, even uh, someone who is academically inadequate, mm -hmm. as long as you can persist, I started this business at the age of two. Mm -hmm. And today, I can tell you, I'm going to be turning 70 next uh, uh, two months. I don't know how I'm going to get off this train. <laughs> that will be a question. <laughs> Great. So as you all know, changing narratives is part of the theme of this festival here today. And you all started the business 20 to 30 years ago. So can you comment on what the, your audience and the business was like when you started and what it is like today? So when I started off, um, as I just told you, we had the, we, I bought this sandwich place in Oakland, and we had the Loma Preta earthquake, and overnight we were started losing money. So for two years, I stood there thinking, oh, the buildings will get fixed, people will come back. But they don't come back. New places open up, and who wants to come to a place which hasn't been renovated in the last two years? And crime went up, and so we just then something we had bought for 175000 which was a ton of money for us when we came to the country. We sold for 60 and got out of it because crime had just soared up over there. And then, um, while we were losing money, I had started making these sauces and keeping them on my counter to sell. And they started selling. People would go away from there and come back from Stockton to come back. I'd come back and say, oh, we want to come back because we want your sauce. That gave me the idea that I was going to get into doing sauces which made Indian food easy for the younger generation because they were going off cooking Indian food and when they wanted to cook it and they looked at the recipe book, 14 spices, they would just cut it and put it away. And during the process, every time they did it, they got a different end product. So I started, I said, you know, I'm going to make it easier. So I got, I made these sauces and we started selling them. And when we sold the deli, I said, I told my husband, I said, this. He said, you've got to get a job, otherwise you won't be able to survive. I said, you know, I have to give this two years of my life. If it doesn't work, I'll quit. But I have this gut feeling that this is going to work. And then he gave me 110% support, and we started off on the journey. Of That's okay. That's okay. So, so 
what was your initial consumer like that you went out with and the product? Yeah. And so when then I started doing demos, there were a few very, very ethnically exposed stores in the, in the Bay Area. One was Berkeley Bowl and one was Monterey Market. And whatever I made and took with me, I used to sell at the demo. So, but in other stores, more mainstream like Diablo Foods and Adronicals and all, if a hundred people walked into the store, only 30 would taste and say, oh, sorry, I don't like it, it's too spicy, or I don't like, you know, and I would say, listen, this is not curry that you eat in a Chinese restaurant. This is different. Taste it. If you don't like it, I had a very beautiful jar, you know, tasty jar of mango chutney, which I also used to make. I said, I'll change your food. So out of the 25% that tasted the food, we had 80% buy the product and order. But now, as the years went by, uh, people who do demos don't want to do them. They say, no, we get so exhausted. People just come and eat. So that's the way things are changed. Mm -hmm. And we do pride ourselves that we brought Indian food to the Bay Area. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, changing narratives, beginning, and what the consumer looked like, your challenges, and then today, how easy it is to sell. But I think when we started, it, it wasn't, the, the consumer hasn't changed for me that much because my first store was in NYU, which is just a lot of young people. So, um, I mean, young people obviously, are, you know, like it's food that is, um, they open very late at night in that location. They open to five o'clock in the morning. So I have, and it's like the trampiest part of the village, the, the New York village and um, there are like 19 different cuisines and NYU is right around the corner. Today, but when we started, it was, um, I'd like to say 50, uh, no, maybe 70, 30, 30% 30 uh, others and 70% South Asian. And I think today it is 50-50. Like if you look at a line in Carty Roll on, uh, at any lunchtime or dinner, you see that it's very mixed which was not how it was uh, 20 years ago. Um, so I think for us, it's all about being led in by a South Asian into the restaurant. And then it's easier for people to then come on their own after they've been led in. But I, I mean, in terms of my clientele, I, it's not very different from 25 years ago. It's, yeah, it's not different. Yeah. All right. And so when I started in 2003, you know, we had just a couple of batters. And uh, I think we sold some 3,000 containers in the first year. You know, so I had to go drop it off in my car. You know, uh, basically they pay me, they fold it, etc. So that, that was a lot of work for the first three years. From a consumer point of view, if I had to make a statement, today, this year, we will sell a million things. You know. And uh, we have 15 varieties of batter. You know, this is the largest variety of batters anywhere in the world. Nobody in India also has this batter over the business. When we started in 2003, there were two manufacturers, you know, in the Bay Area. Today there are about seven or eight of them. Throughout America, there is about 200, 200 to 450 people. You know, that is what it is. And if you take a look at the consumer behavior, the new millennial crowd is coming in. They are trying to find out how to address the you know, uh, a dosa. What is a dosa? It is basically rice, lentils, water, and salt. No dampam gum, no additives, nothing else. And naturally fermented, probiotic, gluten-free, you can't expect a better product than this. And uh, having, you know, the consumers who have supported me over a period of years, 160 million dollars have been consumed. I can tell you, I thought I have done a lot, but taking a look at the landscape today, I feel I haven't done anything there. And I'm going to tell you, my vision and mission is to make sure a billion dosas are consumed and we have a bigger ask than we thought. <laughs> love it, love it. Love it. So, um, looking back on your journey, can you tell us, about a time that there was either a, a fork in the road where you had to make a big decision 
that was getting you to be uneasy or a big barrier that came in your way that was just going to halt or slow down your path. Um, how did you approach it? And, and looking back on it today, you know, what, what do you have to give advice to other people who, are, who may be facing such things? I'm going to talk about here, but I did have two. But I go to the second one first. There came a time where you know we had um, you know, all my children had joined the business with me, one after the other, and we had one very important person who came first to my company was Katie. Sitting there, I call her my business daughter. She brought the first systems into the company, which encouraged my children to join. So I had come to a point where I. I didn't know what else to do. It, they brought orders. I just looked at it. Are we going to make money? And if we made money, we did it. But I was, we were not going strategically. And that was my challenge. And they kept saying, no, 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 you're doing things right. I said, no, I'm not doing something right. This has to grow in a different direction. We had another company come to us which was, uh, who wanted to invest in us and take us further. And we went into a long uh, journey of two, three months working with them. And I told them, please make a business plan and show it to me, and if I don't go with you, what do I owe you for that business plan? I want that first down in numbers, which they did. And uh, we went through the whole process. They wrote on all this forecast for what sales we would have in the first year after they invested $3 million in our company. And then I looked at the plan and I said, they're going to, we are, we are not dying for money. We are totally solvent. We haven't borrowed any money from anybody, for anyone. We are profitable. So why would I take $3 million and get the company into debt? The first year, we were going to be losing money, according to them. Our grosses would go up, but we'd be losing. And all we were doing was paying ourselves and then higher salaries. So that next morning, we had to sign the papers on this deal. And I called all the children home. And I said, I feel this is not the right thing for us. I'm not, I don't want to sign. And they turned around and said, Mom, just do what you want because your gut has always been right. And we never signed the papers. And the following year, we had done more than what they had put in their plan, and we were profitable. I think the, the first time that I came to Crossroads, uh, not Crossroads, but came, had a barrier was before I even started. Um, I had uh, seen, I wanted to open a daytime store. I didn't want to do a nighttime store. I wanted to do a lunch uh, crowd. And so I was looking at the space uh, in near the World Trade Center. And we were supposed to sign the next day. And I remember the landlord's name was Mr. Fox. And uh, the night before, the agent called and he said, uh, he's changed his mind. And he's getting cold feet because you don't have any um, background in food or, and you know, like, you're very new, and so he decided to pull out. And I was just devastated because it had taken me so long to find that space. But maybe like three weeks later, the towers fell. And had I been there and had signed that, it would be over for me. There was no way I would have been able to sustain that the loss. I wouldn't have been able to, you know, like survive that time that everything shut down in that area. So that was one, and it was like a good a good thing that happened. The universe like kind of protected me. And um, I think the second time that I uh, done a bit of a Don Quixote move was uh, when I opened in London. When I decided that one day I just decided that I was going to open in London and um, kind of move lock, stock and barrel and just wait for the phone to ring for an agent to call me to come and see a space. Because demand is always greater than supply in, all the, in New York or London or any of these places. So it was just that, just sitting at home, waiting for the phone to ring, and one day it rang. And we got the space we have now off Oxford Street in Soho, which is a great location. And, um, but it's a different country, with different laws, and I mean, everything is different. It's more archaic, it's, you know, it's, um, and people thought I was crazy, and it was a bit of a crazy move. But now when I look back, it was just amazing, because that, that, so, I mean, as it was a more difficult market, because they're much more evolved in the UK with Indian food, um, once we broke into that market, there was really no looking back. So, yes, I mean, I have a ton of 
really stupid things that I've done that have got me into super trouble, but that's for another day. So, most of my raw materials is in the COVID coming here. So, when we started the business in 2003, uh, I think in 2004 or 5, India banned uh, rice. So, we managed to get rice to a customer who suddenly got them. After we solved that problem, then they banned the dal. <laughs> so, we, we suddenly found out dal is available in Burma, Malawi, and all these places. So, we managed to get that. Then we were chugging along, and then, of course, uh, COVID hit us. You know, when COVID hit us, uh, you know, we, normally we will get a container in 45 days. COVID made sure we got it only after 120 days or 160 days. The price went up by six times as far as the container cost and the rest of the So we got the material, you know, we were looking at what to do, etc. Some containers got stuck in China and uh, we were worried what to do. Then the next lot of containers, we decided to get through Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka economic collapse happened, that was delayed. Then we decided we'll get our containers to New York City. We got our containers within 40 to 60 days. Bottom line, you know, uh, you know, today in life, the only thing I'm certain is uncertain. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Um, and that's true. Any business, anything, there are several authors out here, which is entrepreneurship at its forefront with all the aspects of making the word work. Um, and uncertainty is, is the big topic. Um, okay, I'm going to take a little uh, detour here and ask you more of a hypothetical, conceptual, maybe. Um, what does the term authentic mean to you? Um, do you think there is an authentic Indian recipe? Or should Indian food, as it is morphed through the ages in India, continue to morph in the U.S.? What, what do you have? What do you feel about that? Who wants to? You want to take that first? Everything at at least the parties and dosas. Otherwise everything changed. And over the years, even over the centuries in India, food has changed and it's keeping on doing that even when it has come to the US. Local flavors meld into it and we are still Indian food, you're using the spices that we use over there, but the flavors have changed. And that's what is acceptable to even our own children. I hear all my friends and their kids say, oh, we love your food. Well, it's not really authentic tikka masala that we used to eat. But that is what it is. That is what it is. And every dish keeps morphing as time goes on, which it is doing in India as well. So authentic is what it is today. So tikka masala itself is a UK phenomenon, yeah, which yeah. is kind of indicative of what authentic is there. I think that we were having this conversation on the way here. With, uh, my husband and I were having a conversation about what authentic means and um, the changing, how food has changed, and that the introduction of tomatoes only happened with the British uh, maybe 150 years ago. So, and now can you imagine cooking without tomatoes? It's unheard of. Well, we, I, I mean, I cook very few things without. So, I guess that's true. What is authentic and what is today? And um, I think authentic for us in Kati will mean that we try to keep the same flavors as they are how I ate growing up and not preempt a palate. I mean, I think that a lot of us, uh, when we introduce Indian food to uh, you know, people from the West, we try to preempt their palate. And I feel like for me, authentic means not preempting the palate and um, you know, cutting the spice level down, cutting sharpness, because that is authentic, how we ate it back home. And, yeah, maybe that, that's what it is. So, Italy and dosa, you know, the dosa recipe is about 2,000 years old. Yeah. You know, it is basically rice, lentils, water, and salt, and naturally fermented. And that is what we have done. We have kept the authenticity completely, how it was 2,000 years ago, or how my mother will make it at my wedding. That is how we have kept the authenticity. What we have managed to do is offer a consistent, comfortable product at a price point at which even during these inflationary days, people can still love it. 
So authenticity, as far as Italy and Georgia is concerned, I can tell you, it is still authentic. The way it is done anywhere in the world. Anything else, you know, in terms of modification, etc., just is not there. It's done. So Mani Ji, I'm going to ask you. Uh, I'm going to use all the Mani Ji, Mani Sir, Mani. Right. Okay. Um, so do you see? You said I agree. Idli and dosa, all these recipes. Um, is was dosa always made with other things other than rice, or is that something you brought into the game? So uh, you know, today, like I said, we have about 18 bars. We have idli, dosa, mm -hmm. which is more or less the same recipe. Then we have bari, which is a lentil and a rice combination. Then we have oats dosa. We have uh, millet dosa. We have millet idli. We have bari dosa. Right. We have sorghum dosa. We have about 18 varieties. None of them, the other millet varieties, do not have any rice. It is completely rice. -based. Right, but do you, was is that authentic in your mind? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. See, we don't use any preservatives. Yeah. You know, when we put it into the fermentation room, it is naturally done. Yeah. So there is no external factor which basically, uh, what shall I say, uh, uh, in any way, uh, lose the authenticity that that product will Got it. Got it. Um, okay, so now I'm going to move forward. Um, you, Mani Ji and Mom, Suki, <laughs> um, as you look forward to the next 20 years, Pyle, do you see yourself doing this for the next 30 years, Pyle? Okay, well then it applies to you also. Um, so as you look forward, uh, what, is, what are your expectations of the next generation to take your legacy forward with all the hard work you've done building these businesses? So, you know, first thing I'm going to tell is I'm going to talk about AI. All of you know what AI is. In my opinion, AI is amazing. Thing. And I have a couple of other coins. I, I also want to talk, talk about open DI. What is open DI? Dosa in Italy. You know, and I'm not a VC, but I want to be a VC by selling what I am talking. <laughs> so, you know, in terms of looking at the future, like I said, even though we have sold a lot, the area, we've been lucky enough to be in a high-tech area with a low-tech facility, and it is an enormous opportunity. When I look at the landscape today, we have a lot of ventures. 77, when I came here, I drove 50 miles to Emeryville to have a dosa. 50 miles to a dosa. Today, our vision is we are actually starting a, a project called Shasta Fresh. We are going to create home entrepreneurs in a five mile radius. You know, we want people to be making idli, dosa, vada, and coffee at your neighborhood so that it is like a Uber or a Airbnb model. We want dosa and idli and anything available. Anytime you want to think about it, it should be available. Either in the form of raw material or in the form of uh, batter which you can use or in the uh, in, uh, in finished goods you know and we are also some of those ventures like I said uh, my colleague uh, Shamla is here she is going to be heading it we are going to create hopefully women entrepreneurs at home who are right now will find it very difficult to go to a real estate space etc legally apply for a kitchen license and uh, open up etc and I, I hope to see the day I don't have to drive 50 miles in a final radius. My son quipped yesterday, Dad, the way you are going, people will drive away from these uh, uh, locations. That is how many locations that is quite possible. And uh, I haven't, uh, you know, the way I see it is, the possibility of South Indian cuisine getting to the next level is an opportunity that has just arrived. And I will do whatever that is possible in spite of my age limitations to make it happen. Wonderful. That's a great answer. Files, do you want to? <laughs> All right. So the question is, yes. Right. Uh, yeah. So, you know, one of the main things which I always, my mind always battled with was, how do I make this company? Oh. How do I make this company that it doesn't need me? It has to move on on its own. What are the legs we can do? So if I take myself, because 
I used to do catering to start with. I had no choice. I didn't have any money. And uh, I would do catering on the weekends and produce the stuff during the week and go and sell at the stores. And uh, when the choice came that the company was going bigger, I didn't have, I had to decide which route I wanted to take. Catering is a very heady business. When you cook this food which people love and you serve it to them, you feel very, very satisfied. But it was, that is where it would end. If I took myself away from, from the food, there was nothing left. I could not pass it on to my children. So there was no question of the choice. It ha I had to go the way I was going with prepared food at the store. And then, again, again, it was this only, how do I make this company big enough where it is not dependent on me and it is not dependent on anybody else? It will be a life of its own and it will move on. And that's what my children joined and they are still involved with the company. And we, I think, I have reached what I wanted to do and handing it over to them. It's up to them what to do with now. Yeah. <laughs> I actually talked to both Mani and Suki about this question before and what I really loved, I love their answers, which they didn't give today, but I, I, I really, uh, uh, res it was, there was a lot of respect and admiration for how they approached it. They said that, that they had their dreams in making this business happen, that they didn't start till their 40s and 50s, right? And what they've given to their children is for them to go achieve their dreams earlier. And, um, and I know... Mani, sir, you, you said your, your son is not going to come into the business, is doing his, what he envisioned his life to be. And definitely for us children, what Suki has done has helped us make better choices for ourselves earlier on in life rather than, and given us a lot of freedom to go explore what we want to do. So that was where I was going. <laughs> so I think uh, now we're going to take some questions and... Uh, we have post-its and a pen for all those who don't get to answer, ask their question. Put your email address and your question, and I will make sure this panel, I will take that responsibility, gets back with answers, whoever gives the answer from the panel. So um, first question. Go ahead. Sorry. That's a big fat lie. <laughs> Don't give up. Persist. If you have been in the restaurant business for two years, uh, I think uh, you're, you're there. You know, uncertainties and other things will keep on happening. But uh, the bargain today is if you have survived in the restaurant business for one year, you're, you're already crossed the threshold, especially during COVID. Incidentally, I've been to your restaurant. I love it. <laughs> so I, I'm not... Uh, I did start a restaurant, a fast food place, and gave it up in six months. Decided that was not the route I wanted to go because things changed. You know, the chef is gone, and then you're standing over there getting everything done. So, and I already had this business going, and so I said, no, I just closed the door, rented it out for the rest of the lease, and went back to the thing. But kudos to you. Restaurant businesses are very difficult, and if you have survived, and you have a dream of going on with it, go ahead. 
Good. Well, my advice to you is um, honestly exactly what she was saying, like uh, cross train, cross train, cross train, cross train, so that everybody in your restaurant can do everything. So you're never held hostage to one person or a, a skill. Everybody should be able to do everything, and I think that uh, really helps a lot because then you can remove yourself from the daily, you know, whatever, and it will still carry on. So, Shasta Fresh, uh, we are, uh, it's a franchisee model. We want to open up uh, home kitchen in a five mile radius. We will provide all the building blocks for baking, uh, we have the equipment for the easy, the dosa, vada, and coffee. And uh, it will also be a place a platform where we'll be able to generate business for them. We want to make sure they apply for the license in the in the county, make sure they have food handling issues, etc. We will provide them all the round things. And if we give you an idea right now, we can offer about 20 types of things. We are going to offer uh, from a plate, uh, we'll have about 10 types of uh, you know, hard plates, uh, you know, small and tea, sake and tea, lota and tea, green tea, whatever you want, including Western Yes. Yeah. So, so you can send us a mail at uh, contact at shantapresh.com. Seven years ago, we said, you know, to uh, instinct told me, not so much instinct told me. <laughs> and uh, we started the importing millet. Millets, uh, to give you an idea, there are nine variants. Kinwa, there is only one variant. The protein and the fiber and other things is much bigger. We sell about 40 to 50 items of uh, millet based items. It could be millet flour, it could be millet seve, it could be millet diamond, millet grain, millet mongol, millet biryani. We have a whole range of products. We decided to dabble in batter. You know, decided to dabble in batter. We just kept the process the same. You know, basically the millet grain, urda, natural fermentation, that's it. So, yeah. so, So authentic in that term is not the authentic recipe. It's grown and evolved based on what's available naturally. You know, we're all going through climate change. There's going to be a lot of things that run out. So, so this year is the year of the millet for, yeah. uh, for India. Yeah. And I can tell you just a long statistic. You know, for those of you who are in software, you know, I know very well that there are about 170 to 200 million dollars worth of Let me tell you, in the next 10 years, Agriculture and processed food will reach a level which will be comparable to software. Wow, that's great. Yeah. It will be comparable yeah. to software. One, two, and zero. then. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, there's, I know there's a question in the back that came from. Was it somebody? Yeah, and then they'll do this, and then three more. Yeah, go ahead.
Who wants to take that? So, you know, I can talk about it. Yeah. But uh, there are two initiatives I want to tell you. One is the millet. You know, millet, uh, one of the best part of the grain, you know, you can grow it twice a year. The, the amount of water that is needed for it to grow is very less. So that is one initiative, and I attended a conference uh, last year in, um, uh, in Delhi, where uh, France Modi spoke, and uh, there were 150 agricultural ministers who had attended this function. You know what is the best part of it? All of them were from Africa. <laughs> None of them from Europe. None of them from Europe. Agriculture, because the government of India is now making a major push, as you know, and a lot of these grains are now grown in Ethiopia and multiple countries. That is one answer that I want to The other is we also get the heritage rice. Heritage rice, India is the largest producer of rice variety. From a quantity point of view, China is number one, but from a variety point of view, India is the largest. There are now some grains which are making a comeback, which is completely pesticide free and they are using uh, new processes and other things. As far as supply chain is concerned, uh, what we have is what we have today, but I think in the next uh, five years, you know, India will have individual ability to have its own ships, etc. And, you know, it's work in progress. And uh, like I told you, I, I've seen so many uncertainties. I just uh, don't worry. Uh, the question was that how much of it so for cardio like the way we uh, envision it we none of our stores are in like say an Indian Indian neighborhood we're not in Jackson Heights we're not on Lexington Avenue we made sure that our stores are you know in the village or in Soho in London because we really wanted to it like yeah the Indians are going to buy your product but if you really want to uh, if you really want to succeed or make everybody aware of it, you can't be in a uh, very Indian neighborhood. So that that's how I feel like is a way to introduce it to everybody. Like, you know what I mean? Like, not to be in a, I don't know what the, the equivalent neighborhoods here, Indian neighborhoods here would be, but yeah, it's a conscious effort not to be in South Hall or to be, uh, but to be in, you know, mainstream, yeah. So when I started off, you know, the first tendency is take your stuff to Indian stores. So I went to a few Indian stores in Berkeley and I went to San Francisco and I took my masalas over there in bottles and they said, Rak jaye, big jayega to paise de denge. <laughs> so I said, fine. I was very confident of the product because everybody who had used it was very, very happy with it. So I left it there. After a month or so, I called them and I said, Aapka bidya? Aa jaiye, jab manager hoga, to aake paise le jaiye. Okay, so I wasn't going there. I went to another store who was a friend store, uh, being a, introduced by a relative, and she said, that, you know, I kept, she said, ji, ek case, I'll speak in Punjabi if you understand. Ek case ki rakho ge, ji, chest te paro. <laughs> so I said, fine. So I put three, chest, three cases of my product over there and left. And a month and a half later, when I called her, she said, oh, to Sarah, it was all spoiled. I threw it all away. I said, why didn't you call me? But that was the end of my journey to Indian stores. I, after that, just concentrated on the mainstream stores. 
I would fall, and as Sanjuk told you, in the first year, I got into 110 Bay Area stones. I would take my stuff, and I would get the men. I would call the store, and the manager asked for the manager, and he would say, come on in, bring it, and show it to us. So I would cook up my chana masala and tandoori chicken and curry and, and make them taste it. And they said, this is wonderful. When can you bring it in? And that was, I mean, that was my, at the end of my journey for Indian stores, I just concentrated on mainstream. And also, my goal was to bring Indian food to the mainstream. So going to the Indian stores was not going to help me, which where it price point, price point, and price point was the only criteria to sell there. So we just moved away from there, and we went on to the mainstream. Yeah. 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 So the, the South Asian diaspora has given me the foundation and the one, you know, just to I started with Costco about two years ago. You know, uh, the Costco approached us about five, six years ago and said, uh, we want to give you a dosa. And uh, they said that we want it 25% cheaper than the Indian store. I refused. I said, I'm not going to build my castle on somebody else's grave. Because the Indian store supported me when I started in 2003, and I am well spread out with all the Indian stores. And anyway, today in Costco, we went in about two years ago, and uh, I can tell you, out of the 55 locations in the Bay Area, we are there almost in 18 locations. Oh, and, uh, you know, see, one of the things they said is, why don't you rename your dosa? It's an Indian tray for an Indian family. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to do that. Ten years down the road, when people look at a dosa, they should say, it's a crepe or a pancake. <laughs> that is what they need. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, again, I want to thank all three of you because I have eaten all of your products, and uh, the question about authenticity was really interesting, but also, I think when, like, Auntie, I've eaten, like, your samosa and the chutney, the kati roll that I went to the new NYU location after midnight, and it just felt like it transported me. And the same thing, I've tried other dosa batters, but nothing compares to Shasta. So I don't think this, this panel and what you all do is just about Indian food. There's something in each of your recipes <coughs> that is transporting us back to the homeland, even while it's appealing to other people. Uh, what trade secrets can you share today <laughs> <laughs> about about what what like when did you feel like you hit it? Like it's a two thousand year recipe, but many people I'm sure have tried, but it doesn't hit the spot like each of your three products do. And a follow up to this question that I was hoping Sanjay would ask, maybe she's still going to ask, is uh, what is, what do you crave that you don't make somebody else's? So uh, this is an opportunity to uplift any new entrepreneurs or restaurants or brands that you think we should be supporting? You know, one thing I want to mention, I'm a big movie goer, and uh, when I go to cinema, I buy cooking yes. meals for the house. <laughs> <laughs> it's heaven on earth. <laughs> and uh, the fact that you're able to have it, especially if you go to the movie theater and uh, have a samosa of your liking, that means uh, we have not only arrived, we are going to. Uh, so I think our lettuce, you I think that was actually a factoid I was going to end with. So Payal actually went to an Indian uh, rest. I mean, they, she went and learned how to make kati rolls in the restaurant, and she went and worked there. And I think I've heard that from all of you guys on how important it is to go actually put your time in to learn it before. And again, in cross-training, right? Like when your people are not going to be come showing up, you need to know how to do it. So that, that was a huge thing that I, I read when I researched you, that you actually went and worked and learned it. Yeah. So I have some... <laughs> so I have something to say. I, we, I don't know, the Bay Area, we were very well known for farmer's markets. We used to, we did 
most of the farmers market in the Bay Area. And uh, we used to send nans out over there. So I had my kitchen in San Leandro and I had a girl managing it. So she called me one day on a Saturday and said, Auntie G, naan wala to bhag gaya. He is not going to make naan. He said, Ki, I'm not going to do the naans today. I said, OK, don't worry. Don't call him. I'm coming. So I went in, and both of us made naans that day. And we, I think we threw away at least 30% of the dance because some of them were hanging down and they were not cooked fully and all that. But that made me determined. I said, I am not going to rely on this guy for making naans. And I'm not going to rely on tandoors for making naans because those were the two glitches we had that would not, uh, you know, would stop us from going. In fact, there was a time when Costco came to us. We gave naans to Costco also at one time. And they said, we want you to go to all 25 locations. I said, not at all. Not unless you set up the facility. Because one tandoor gives me 400 nans a day. And I have to have one person standing there all day long. And it takes up all my real estate in the kitchen. So I said, you set up the facilities, and we will do the nans. But we will do them on conveyors. We are not going to do them in the oven. So again, I get lost. Yeah. <laughs> saving, saving. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So what I crave, favorite. my favorite, and I have a big grouse with Mani Ji, that <laughs> <laughs> everybody in my whole circle would come to my house for dosa. They would say, you have spoiled us. We can't go to the Indian restaurants because you make dosa so well. Oh. His dasa batter has taken over now. <laughs> I don't get so many people calling me for my dosas anymore. <laughs> Dosa, dosa, dosa. <laughs> Italy. Dosa. Sambar, sambar, sambar. sambar. <laughs> All right, we have, uh, we have time for one last question, and I have someone picked here already. But you have the post-its, you have the emails. I'll take the responsibility of getting you your answers. So don't so, feel like... Uh, one thing I want to mention. Huh. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Without you guys, I will not be where I am today. And uh, we have a facility which we would like to showcase. Please send a mail and contact at Shastapur. We will schedule for you guys to visit and take a look. You know, I like to call myself as, uh, uh, you know, the Tesla uh, ah. family of Boston. Okay. Right. One last question. So I think that uh, actually the, the lucky part of, for us is that we are the first crossover brand, like that we've been able to cross over and uh, the following is such that it is your DoorDash kids who uh, have no problem spending as much money for delivery as for the food. So uh, yeah, we're going to be that brand hopefully and we hope to see you soon. I, years ago, I put up an uh, Indian Express in Berkeley and yeah. Telegraph Avenue. But it was too early. Mm -hmm. It was not the right time. And the right time is now, but I'm 75. Now it is for other people. To see. Now she's going to write a book after being inspired by Shobha Day. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Thank you very much. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you all. Thank you.